Hey everybody, it's me Amanda with Once in a Wild. Good morning if you're here in Texas and good evening if you're in Abu Dhabi time. It's going to be a really fun show this morning and thank you for joining us for this very special time with our very special guest. Uh, let me go ahead and have him introduce himself. Go ahead, special guest. All right, so hello Once in a Wild. I'm Moti from Moti Malls and um, I decided to do, go live with Amanda as her special guest and Today we're gonna to be seeing some really cool animals. So, um, Amanda, who are you? Well, my name is Amanda and our company is called Once in a Wild. We are a mobile zoo based here in Texas. And I know I am basically streaming all the way to Abu, Abu Dhabi today, right? That's where you guys live, right? Yeah. Awesome. This is the furthest that I've ever had anybody stream into my program. So that's pretty exciting. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I know a lot of people have seen me before and a lot of people have seen you before, but since um, people on my channel are new to you, why don't you tell everybody about yourself first and then I'll tell everybody about myself and we'll meet the animals afterwards. How does that sound? That sounds perfect. All right, so I'm Moti and I have a YouTube channel called Moti Moles and every, and in that YouTube channel, I fly to all these places around the world, let's say um, big places like New York, South Africa, um, Hong Kong. I've been to lots of places and I've seen some of the world's most iconic animal species like pandas, I've seen dolphins, um, I've seen lots of different animals. And um, during quarantine, I've actually been teaching a lot of kids about animals, let's say 600 plus kids around the world. and it's been really fun because, you know, COVID is pretty bad, but we're getting used to it. All right. Yeah, we're, all kind of adapting. we're all kind of adapting too, even us here at Once in a Wild. So we're normally going to bring animals to like classrooms and birthday parties and all kinds of stuff. Uh, we're celebrating back to school right now. So that's pretty exciting. Um, we have had to adapt because of COVID, of course. So we're now bringing the zoo to you virtually as well. So we have our regular programs too um, and special programs just like today. So that's something that we do. And we have a whole lot of animals that can participate in animal programs. <laughs> All right, so what's with the purple background? It looks really cool. Oh, thank you. That's just part of our, our color scheme. So Once in a Wild is a very colorful company. We're very fun. We try to be really exciting and fun um, because that gets people's attention. And we want people to notice us, not just for us, but so they can learn about the animals, which I know is important to both me and Moti Moles and Moti, of course. Um, and we wanna make sure that we're a lot of fun, but we also have an educational message. So it just gets people's attention. We love different colors. A uh, purple almost looks good on everybody and every animal. So it's just the color we picked for our backdrop. <laughs> All right, perfect. So um, before we get to the animals, I just wanna ask you one more question. Are you a sure. zoologist? So I am a zoologist. I have a zoology degree from the Santa Fe College Teaching Zoo, which is over in Florida. I heard that you guys used to live in Florida, which is a pretty small world. Um, and um, I got my degree over there from a specialized uh, zoo school. And that was several years ago. But even before that, I've been working with animals for a long, long time since I can remember. So I've been working professionally with animals for about 20 years now and doing all kinds of jobs. And I decided to go back to school not too long ago, about mm, I think it was about six or seven years ago to restudy my passion, which is zoology. And since then, I've had the opportunity to work at all kinds of different animal facilities, including the Dallas Zoo, San Antonio Zoo, um, SeaWorld, the, um, the Texas State Aquarium, and even many more. So I've had a lot of really cool opportunities to work with tons of animals, and my passion is actually animal outreach. So that's what I do for myself now at Once in a Wild. So I've had the opportunity to work with a ton of different animals, um, all the way from great big giant uh, hoof stock like giraffe, all the way down to amphibians like the axolotl. <laughs> All right, so um, the axolotl, can you say a little bit about the one next to you? Of course I can, thank you for asking. So this one right here, she's an albino. We call her a golden albino. It's just a special color that we have in the care of humans that has been bred. Um, they would not look like this in the wild, but this is an axolotl and her name is Ghost because she looks like a little floating ghost and she's super adorable. And um, these guys are actually from a very, very tiny area in Mexico. They're actually from Mexico City, very specifically. And they live in the Xochimilco uh, River Canal system out there in Mexico. And they are actually a critically endangered species which is pretty sad yeah i think yeah. one of the main reasons are 
Um, I think pollution in the rivers are, can you actually say some of the effects that um, axolotls are facing out there in the wild? Absolutely. There are so very many that are causing them to be critically endangered. First of all, they're starting off with a very small habitat, right? So they don't have a ton of space as is. So that is going to be their main um, challenge in the wild, just naturally. And since they live near a lot of humans near the city of Mexico City, naturally you're going to have a lot of trash and debris and um, chemicals and things like that that might end up in their waters. They're also a very cold water species. They live in waters uh, anywhere from 50 to around, I would say, upper 60s um, Fahrenheit. Um, so they like it very chilly in their waters. So right now we're experiencing climate change as well. So climate change affects, affects them for their temperatures. They don't like it hot. Um, pollution, right? And trash, like plastic. And um, just having that small habitat in the first place. And also invasive species. Do you know what invasive species are? Yes, there, there are lots of them down in Florida. So they're basically critters from other places around the world. And they're basically shipped to specific countries like Florida. There's the Burmese python, there's plants and other animals. So that's absolutely. So what happened with these guys, with the invasive species, there are several of them that affect them, obviously. Um, but the main ones are going to be big fish, like carp and tilapia. And those fish are really big, and they shouldn't be there. They're not from there. Um, but they were put in the whole kind of river system around Mexico City for people to go fishing. So they would have something to catch. And because humans did that a long time ago, those fish are growing really, really big and eating axolotls. But they're also eating the axolotls' food. So they're, they're putting a lot of pressure on them that way as well. All right. So um, the axolotl, um, I can see it has like little fan, it has like little fan organs around its head. What are those? Sure. So the axolotl is an amphibian. So all amphibians do begin their life underwater, regardless if they are a toad, a frog, any animal, even a tree frog starts life in the water, um, which is an egg. So when mom lays the egg and dad fertilizes the egg, um, they're going to start their life underwater. Um, and then they hatch out as a tadpole, right? Everybody knows that. And then they start to grow legs and usually they'll start coming up on dry land gradually as they grow and they lose those things on the side of her head, which are actually her gills. So just like fish have gills, but their gills are kind of flat. Axolotls have gills that look like feathers on the side of their head. And that's how they breathe underwater. But what's different about the axolotl and many things are different about her and we'll talk about that too, is that she never loses her gills. So this animal would actually just stay as as kind of like a baby forever. <laughs> They're kind of like Peter Pan, but in the amphibian world, they never grow up. <laughs> so that's what those are, is her gills to breathe underwater. That is very cool. So um, most amphibians like frogs, toads, and salamanders, like the axolotl, they're known as amphibious creatures. And it's not just amphibians. Um, there's also some mammals like the capybara, giant otters, um, alligators, um, lots of other animals are amphibious, which means that they spend most of their time in the water, but they also like to go on land. So That's the actual model is really, it's really aquatic. So if it were to go out of the water, I don't think it would last that long like a fish. Right. So they're basically, um, uh, just always in the water. So that's another thing that's, that's, um, kind of putting pressure on them in the wild too, is that they can't like go out on dry land and find another lake to live in. <laughs> they stay in the water all the time. So if their habitat is destroyed or polluted or full of invasive species, they're not gonna make it. In fact, these guys are critically endangered, which is the next step under critically endangered is extinct in the wild. And just to show everybody or to give everybody an illustration on how uh, rare they are now, in the last 20 years or so, they've gone from about 6,000 per kilometer per square kilometer to about 35 per square kilometer or less. So it's not great for them. Okay. All right. So another burning question. I've heard that some lizards like skinks and some amphibians like the salamander, they have the ability to um, detach their tail as a defense mechanism. And then as, as time goes on, it starts to grow back. Does that happen with the axolotl? Yes, she can actually lose her tail and grow her tail back. Now, it's not the same as a lizard where it would kind of snap off at will. Um, but what's really cool about the axolotl is she can lose her tail to maybe like a predator or something like that or an accident. Um, she could also lose her arm or her gills or even part of her body, even part of her head. And all of those organs, 
parts of our body, tail, limbs, that would all actually regenerate afterwards. So they are really, really awesome. That is their main kind of superpower, if you will. Not only do they never grow up, <laughs> which is pretty cool already, um, they also can regenerate almost anything on their body. So if they lose something, they just grow it right back as long as they have enough of that um, like say if they lose part of their head, if they have like half a head left, they can grow their head back. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> that sounds amazing. Imagine being able to um, snap off your own arm and then in just a couple weeks, then it just starts to grow back and then you have another wiggling arm. That's amazing, right? So for that reason, these guys are studied a lot in science. So that's how we started keeping um, axolotls in the care of humans, actually, it was through scientific research. It wasn't through having them as pets. It wasn't through anything at all. Um, it was through scientists. So they started breeding them and things like that. And that's the good news about axolotl is they breed really well in the care of humans. So zoos that have them that are um, participating in conservation work with them and over in Mexico City where they're actually doing that as well, they're doing really well in the care of humans. We just have to fix their environment before we re-release them back into the environment if we ever do, which is the, the challenge right now. All right, so do you have another animal to show us? Absolutely. Let me check and see if anybody has any questions about the axolotl first. And I do apologize. I didn't say hello to anybody yet. Let's see who's chiming in really fast. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us in this special time. And what time is it over there in Abu Dhabi right now? Right now, it is 7 11 p.m. Oh, someone said good morning. Uh, yeah, I think that, that, must, that must be on my end. Good morning to you and good night to everybody else. <laughs> good morning, Victor. It looks like a lot of people are tuning in. Very cool. Let me see if anybody has any questions whatsoever about any of our animals. Uh, and Oh, and yes, and Ricky is saying um, that part of the reason we picked all the colors is we're artists here at Once in a Wild. So we love art. Um, so that's one reason why we picked a, a really wide color scheme too. Just something different. Let's see who else is coming in. It looks like Donna is tagging all her friends. That's a really great way to help both of our channels out is by tagging your friends and sharing our videos, liking and subscribing to our, our YouTube channels as well. Um, those are all free ways that you can help us out. So I'm just going through the comments just to make sure there's not anybody um asking any questions <laughs> all right and you're doing a great job so far everybody says i think everybody's just saying hello so very very good so yeah so these guys are awesome i just want to also talk about one more thing what do you think we can do to help um conserve animals that are endangered what are some things that we can help the environment what do you think well i think you should um probably stop throwing all your waste and all your trash in um the rivers of the axolotls range and that even though that doesn't really help them a lot it still helps them so i think you should just um think twice before you leave let's say if uh, you were just at a river and axolotls are nearby if you were to drop any trash you would have to pick it up because then the axolotls could possibly die if nothing happened so i think you should just pick it up and also try to pick up as much plastic as you can just like the oceans Absolutely. It's the same exact, um, basically, uh, method that you just described as any animal all over the planet, even amph amphibians all over the world, um, animals in the ocean, like you said, we can do all kinds of stuff like picking up trash. That sounds really lame, but it's actually one of the best ways that we can help um, animals in general, because any animal can come in contact with trash and debris. And who knows what animal is going to be endangered next because we are using plastic. Plastic is a terrible thing for the environment. Um, you can do things like using reusable water bottles and bags and reusable straws. That is the main thing that actually uh, doesn't ever go away in the ocean and in waters all over the place is plastic straws. And they're a great shape for getting stuck inside of animals' throats and things like that. That's a terrible mm -hmm. thing. <laughs> so that's an important thing to tell everybody is to use reusable straws if you can. That's a great idea. All right. Okay, All right. so, so this is gonna be here the whole time. So I'll just let her hang out. <laughs> yeah, she's just sitting there, you know, admiring everything. Yes. <laughs> nice little star. Yeah, if she comes back over here, I'll feed her some more treats. <laughs> I was feeding her some worms, by the way. That's her favorite treat. Okay, let's meet our next Ooh, animal. Good for axolotl. Absolutely. So they are carnivores. They eat all kinds of other animals in the wild and here. Um, and we also feed her a specialized pellet diet as well. It's really good for them too in the care of humans. Um, but in the wild, they're going to eat things like insects and larva and worms and fish and anything that can fit into their mouth. In fact, their scientific name is Ambistoma Mexicanum, which means Mexican glutton. They can eat anything that fits in their mouth. <laughs> 
Oh yeah, kind of like the Wolverine, you know, scientific name, yeah. Google, Latin for glut. Exactly, exactly. So I'm just gonna get our next animal. I'm gonna get our next animal ready. Yes, you are right. And speaking of Wolverine, I actually have a very, very close cousin to the Wolverine coming out next. Ooh, what is it? I wonder what it is. All right, guys. Ooh, it's a ferret. <laughs> so this here is Loki the ferret. And ferrets are in the mustelid family, just like the wolverine. <laughs> wow. All right. So ferrets are actually, like um, Amanda said, they are part of the family mustelidae that includes skunks, um, includes wolverines, and it even, it, it even includes badgers. So that's why ferrets are more closely related to the wolverine. It looks more adapted. It's it's like really, really long and has tiny little legs. Yes. <laughs> so ferrets yeah. are terrestrial, meaning they live on the ground, right? But they're also subterrestrial, meaning they live underground sometimes, like a lot of mustelids and weasels do. And ferrets actually come from a very special animal called the European polecat. And Loki here is actually um, a polecat hybrid. That's why he's so big and why he looks exactly like the European polecat over in Europe. But that is where the domestic ferret comes from. And they've been domesticated for about almost 3,000 years now. Did you know that? Wow, I actually didn't know that. All right, so <laughs> how old is Loki? How old is he or she? Loki, Loki's pretty young. He's a boy. Um, we call a male ferret a hob, which is H-O-B. And um, a hob can get bigger than a, a female ferret, which is, I can't remember what a female ferret is called. I know it's a sprite. And also um, a jill, I think, is another name for a female ferret. But it's, it's like, goes back and forth. But anyway, a hob is a male. And uh, males are bigger. And um, <laughs> he is, I'm trying to remember exactly how old he is. He's got about a year and a half or two years old now. Wow. All right. So how did you get Loki? Was he rescued from the wild or has he spent all his life in captivity? So he was bred in the care of humans in captivity. Um, he actually came from a very, very special responsible breeder. He is not a pet store ferret, which makes him a lot healthier. And he's actually on a raw meat diet as well. He eats a natural diet because ferrets are obligate carnivores. We want to make sure and feed him a very, very good diet. Right now he's getting a treat, which is just some baby food. That's chicken baby food, but it's still chicken. And uh, otherwise he gets all kinds of raw meat here in our care. <laughs> that's really cool. So do you think a ferret might be a good pet for anyone who's trying to get one? That's a great question. I think ferrets are kind of a more advanced pet. Um, they're definitely not an easy pet. They are domesticated and it depends on the personality, just like a cat or a dog, um, whether or not they're gonna make a good pet. Um, but as far as their care, they are very high maintenance. They're very smelly. They make a lot of mess. They need a lot of attention. We always recommend having um, a ferret with another ferret. That way they have a friend. Um, because in the wild, they're actually more solitary, but in um, through being domesticated over time, they've become more social and they like people too. So they make a pretty good companion, um, but they are um, also obligate carnivores. So you can't have them around small animals like birds and even snakes and things like that because they are hunters. They might go after those animals. So you have to be very careful, um, but they're not like a hamster or like something like that where you can basically kind of not really leave them in a cage all the time. I don't mean to say that about a hamster either, but they're definitely more high maintenance, almost like a dog or a cat, but they kind of stay that personality of a puppy all the time. So they're a lot harder of work. <laughs> Mm -hmm. All right, so um, Loki actually looks like the endangered North American black-footed ferret mm. that lives in the prairies. And um, can you tell us a little bit about the black-footed ferret, in, you know, about um, some facts about it? Absolutely. That's a great um, animal to bring up because just like the axolotl, the black-footed ferret is another endangered species that we like to mention as well and a very close relative of all the weasels, including the ferret, right? So that's the only other type of ferret that exists anymore. Um, I don't know if there used to be more types of ferrets in the old days before they went extinct, but I know the black-footed ferret is the only one in the United States and, and in the New World. Um, and they, um, they're they really, really rare now, unfortunately. They actually thought they went extinct and then they were rediscovered, but zoos um, across the United States, a few of them actually started breeding them in the care of humans mm -hmm. to conserve the species and then re-releasing them. It's a huge giant project still going on to this day. And they brought the, the ferret back from extinction, but they're, very similar to this animal right here. 
All right. So I've heard that black-footed ferrets in the wild, they would normally go after prairie dogs. And um, prairie dogs, if you don't know what those are, they're basically like, um, they're a rodent. And um, they basically do like these little yipping sounds. And um, they live they live underground. They're subterrestrial as well, like Loki. And um, they're actually pretty fast creatures. So um, I have a feeling that loki's body if he if he was ever in the wild i think it would be adapted for twisting and turning through all those tunnels that the prairie dogs normally run out run inside absolutely you're correct so yes they do um the black-footed fairy almost primarily only eats prairie dogs i'm sure they would eat other things now and then but that's their main diet and that was one of the reasons they started becoming endangered was because the prairie dogs became more scarce because of habitat destruction like a lot of animals right a lot of animals are affected by habitat loss but this guy here yeah he's definitely um designed to be like in a tunnel system so the the european polecat as well as the black-footed ferret they live underground so they have to go into small tunnels and things like that and they need to be able to maneuver around so they have short legs long bodies and very flexible spines as well he's very very flexible i know he's a big boy but you can see how flexible he is doing those yoga poses and that's because he needs to be able to go into a tunnel and then turn around the other way very very easily right um to be able to get around for sure yeah and he's very fast when he wants to be <laughs> for sure <laughs> All right, so um, also one of the reasons that black-footed ferrets um, became endangered like they are today is um, because farmers in the prairie um, thought that they were going after their chickens, so they decided to normally shoot down the ferrets because they thought they were dangerous threats for their livestock. Like, let's say if there were ducks or chickens, then I guess the ferret would tackle that, but... I don't think it's kind of a good idea because they're big. No, for sure. I mean, a ferret can definitely go after those animals too. They can actually hunt animals up to five times their body weight, which is pretty impressive. Um, and that goes for most of your weasel family type animals. In fact, the small weasels are the most impressive hunters. They can go after animals up to 10 times their own body weight because the weasels are so very, very small. Most weasels are smaller. Um, but yeah, that's a, a very good point to bring up for conservation is a lot of times um, it's human conflict. And what that basically means is humans are coming in, living in the area where the animal already live and then they're um, feeling like the animal is a threat to their livelihood or to them. Maybe people are afraid of animals and so they just kill them, right? Which isn't really good. We need to figure out a better way to cohabitate with animals that are already there because they were there first. Yeah, because let's say, um, I mean, with the axolotl, it's critically endangered. It's almost mm -hmm. extinct in the wild, which means that it doesn't live in the wild anymore, but they're still surviving in captivity. So, right. but the black ferret is just listed as endangered because it's not a, so close to extinct in the wild, but it is pretty close. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that doesn't happen to any yeah. animal. Just because they're not endangered doesn't mean they can't become endangered. Some animals have gone um, have gone from least concern, which is just normal, to endangered very quickly, um, and sometimes gradually, but we don't notice, and that's really sad. So we need to make sure and uh, teach everybody how to cohabitate with animals that maybe they don't like, right? You guys want to meet another animal that a lot of people don't like, and I'll check and see if there's any questions about the ferret or axolotl. That might be All fun. All right. All okay, right. So finish this part. <laughs> Look at him. Uh, Let oh, me know if you have questions about him. Yeah. Speaking of the food, um, can you show us the treats you're giving him? Sure. It's basically just chicken baby food. So he licks it up pretty quickly, but it's easy for me to just get like a, a little bit of it. Can you see it? It's really gross. Oh. <laughs> so it's literally chicken baby food for humans, but it's only chicken. So it's important for them to not have any fruits and vegetables or carbohydrates or um, anything like that because it's not a uh, digestible food for them. So we only feed them meat, but the, the baby food is only for training and for programs and things like that. So it's something special that they get sometimes. <laughs> well, yeah, at least they're getting their proteins because you know they have to be fast in order to catch the prairie dogs if they were ever in the wild. That's All right, right, so do you guys have any questions about the axolotl or the ferret? If you would, um, you could just share it and we would, we would answer them. Yeah, and I'm going to wash my hands really fast because <laughs> I have baby food all over me. I'm going to see if anybody has any questions or comments. This is a very interactive event, like always, you guys, that know me, you know that I love questions. So please ask your questions. Let me check and I can highlight your questions. Uh, Donna says he's a wild man. I think so too. Wild man. 
Here's a good question. Let's see what Moti thinks about this question while I while I watch All right. my hand. Do ferrets get along with cats and dogs in captivity? Honestly, I mm -hmm. think so because let's say if um, cats and dogs lived in captivity together, then they would cooperate. But let's say if an adult dog was meeting an adult cat, they would just lash out. They would growl, bite, scratch. So I have a feeling that ferrets can be friendly. You know, they're friendly with people, so I think they're friendly with other animals. What do you think? Amanda, what do you think? Do ferrets get along with cats and dogs? So it really just depends. We definitely don't recommend that they be left alone together to co-mingle together, but you can probably have them like near each other and things like that, but it, you're gonna have to use your best judgment and you know your pets best. So some cats are very lazy, they don't care about anything. Some ferrets are very lazy and they're very chill with other animals and some ferrets are not. <laughs> Our ferrets are pretty wild <laughs> um, because they are so healthy, raised on a raw diet, they kind of show their wild instincts sometimes. So even though they're a domestic species, right, we still treat them with respect um, because they can potentially hurt each other. So we wanna make sure it's just a, a supervised um, time, if that makes sense. So sometimes yes and sometimes no. Let All me right. see. All right, so if you guys are enjoying this, you should go subscribe to Once in a Wild and you should also subscribe to Moti Malls because um, if you guys subscribe then there's gonna be a lot more animals and there maybe you'll think twice about the animals that you don't like. That's right, here's a good question as well. Do uh, ferrets musky scent intensify when they are scared? So ferrets are mustelids and all mustelids have the ability to spray. The most famous one being the skunk, right? Uh, ferrets yeah. can spray a little bit. They don't spray anything that you see um, out of their anal glands, but they can um, produce a very stinky odor, but it's not that bad. It's not as bad as people imagine it. Um, it actually comes out randomly. <laughs> so it could be when they're afraid. It's definitely a possibility. They're not a super uh, skittish and afraid animal in in general, but if they did get attacked by a potential predator, like a hawk or an eagle or something like that, they could um, do that. But fun thing about hawks and eagles, they can't smell anything. So that's not gonna work against them. But what a ferret does in the bird of prey um, situation is they can actually reach around and bite. Um, that's gonna be their main defense. But if other animals like, I don't know, any other mammalian predator or a predator that can smell, they can release that scent to hopefully deter other animals from eating them, right? That's how the skunk does. That is very true. Honey badger, that is another relative of the mustelids as well. You are right. It looks like Mortimold is having a little bit of a lag, and that's fine. I'll just keep talking. And if you guys have any other questions, thank you for joining us today. <laughs> Let me see. And thank you so much for tagging all your friends. Moti, I think you're having a little bit of a lag on your end, but I'm sure it'll catch up in just a moment. If not, we will restart your part. Let's see here. The prairie dogs here are tiny. You're talking about in Texas. They kind of look like meerkats. So prairie dogs and other ground squirrels and things like that, they do vary depending on where they're from in the habitats that they come from and in the countries they come from, et cetera. So that um, happens a lot with animals. So one really good example is gonna be the cougar or the, the mountain lion, right? So when you go down to Florida, the cougars and mountain lions, same thing. Um, they actually are the Florida panthers, the same thing. Um, they will be smaller down south than they will be up north. And that is because they have to to be larger to survive winters and things like that. I'm gonna suggest that multi-moles, um, I'm gonna remove and come back to that. I'm gonna suggest that you guys, if you can hear me, that you um, exit and come back in because sometimes we have technology issues. Um, this is real life, this is a live program. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you for your patience. Um, this is the first time that uh, I have streamed all the way to Abu Dhabi. So as you might imagine, we're experiencing a little bit of technical difficulties. Let's try it again. I'm gonna add you in. I think right. we're back. We just had a little okay. bit of a blip there. That's okay. What were you saying, Moti, a little bit ago? I couldn't hear you. All right. So the honey badger in Africa, they basically have the same uh, mechanism as skunks and the other weasels because they're also part of the family Mustilidae. And um, they actually have also a very stinky odor. And um, they also have the black and white markings like skunk. Skunk saying, um, you should, probably shouldn't bat... You should back off because I have a very stinky odor. It's like um, a warning flag. And what's really cool about the spotted skunk is that it can actually do a handstand before it actually sprays. So that's pretty cool. 
I agree. Skunks are actually one of my favorite animals. Um, not only are they very misunderstood, but they're really, really personable and intelligent. And most of your musselids, your weasel family animals are very smart. And they're like otters. Everybody knows that otters are really smart, right? And honey badgers and all those guys. But all of them, even skunks are very, very intelligent too. And a lot of people don't like them because they think that skunks are like out to get them or something, which is not the case. Yeah. It's like sharks because everyone yeah. thinks sharks just after after you to eat your flesh, but that's not the case. It's also the same with skunks. They only spray at you when they're threatened. Other than that, skunks are completely friendly and a little exactly. stinky. So let's meet yeah. another animal that some people are uncomfortable with. And I wanna reassure everybody that she is just fine. This is gonna be a really cool one, but a lot of people have phobias against this animal. Wow. <laughs> Do you know what kind of tarantula this is? Actually, I don't. What kind of tarantula is that? So this is uh, Carabina versicolor, which is also known as the pink toe tarantula. Wow. <laughs> I love spiders, and I think they're just very misunderstood. And if you guys ever heard of the little spider Lucas, um, he actually said to change people's minds about spiders like the pink toe tarantula. And... Um, People, I just want people to look, see spiders as amazing because they can do a lot of wonders. Um, most spiders, like the golden orb weaver, they can actually produce web that's really strong. And also they have vibrant colors like gold. Yes, I love spiders too. I think spiders are really important animals. In fact, I know they are because they eat a lot of bugs. So spiders are actually very, very beneficial to humans. A lot of people are scared of them, but they mean us no harm. And there are very few spiders that can actually harm you. Um, you might get bitten, but there are very few that can kill a human being. In fact, there are no deadly tarantulas across the globe. And there are so many species of them. Um, this pink toe tarantula has a very, very mild venom. Um, so even if she did bite somebody, it would be almost nothing. Uh, you could definitely handle it. It's perfectly fine. <laughs> and they're not aggressive either. They're not an aggressive animal. Yeah. So um, for their defense mechanism, they don't actually bite. They actually have hairs. The reason why they're super hairy is because they have their abdomen is full of irritating hairs. And when threatened, they actually rub their abdomen. And then all those irritating hairs flick out into an attacker's face. And then they're just like, ah, ah. So yeah, that's <laughs> so re really they don't use their venom to bite people. They normally use it to catch prey. And um, if you follow me, you might have seen a few weeks ago, I actually did a post on the tarantula and I described it as another Hollywood victim because Hollywood um, described them as huge, scary, and they want to eat you. And that's not true because they're, they're too small to eat you. And normally their bite is just like a bee sting. You'll walk it off. It's fine. Just see a doctor. It's fine. Exactly. Now, if somebody's allergic to those kind of animals, you need to go to the hospital and that's perfectly fine. But it, nobody has ever died from a tarantula bite. It just doesn't happen. <laughs> so they are not out to get us. In fact, we have tarantulas here in Texas that actually will wander certain times of the year, but it's the male tarantula. So most tarantulas actually live underground. Um, they're going to live in a burrow. This is a different kind of tarantula. So we'll talk about her in a minute. Um, but uh, like the Texas brown tarantula, for example, they're going to be on the ground. They live underground. You never see them unless it's time for mating season. And that's when the males will actually leave the burrow to go find a lady friend. So a lot of people here in Texas are afraid of them because they think they're coming after you, but they're really just looking for love. <laughs> so. All right. So also um, there's another creature. If you live in Arizona or um, if you live in Texas, you might have heard of this animal called the tarantula hawk wasp. And like their namesake, they do eat tarantulas like this one on your hand. So what they do is that normally they fly around the Southwest in Arizona and also some parts of New Mexico and even Texas. And they fly around tarantula burrows and when they sense them, they basically create a distraction and basically they, bas they lure the tarantulas to come out of their burrows and then it's like a battle rages on. Um, the tarantula hawk wasp just goes left, right, left, right, dodging the tarantula's attacks and the, the tarantula is not that intelligent so it normally thinks, I'm, I'm just going to bring the tarantula hawk wasp and 
it's probably gonna die. But no, um, the tarantula hawk wasp is the second most painful stinging insect on the planet. Credit to Coyote Peterson for all these facts. And right. um, basically, it paralyzes the tarantula, and it's like I can't move. I'm stuck. Mm -hmm. So then the tarant the tarantula hawk takes it captive to its burrow, and then it lays a single egg on its abdomen, and then it just leaves. And then when the egg hatches, it, it the egg basically does the rest of the work, and the larva actually digs into the spider's organs and eats it alive. So that's kind of crazy. Movie. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like a scary movie. They should make a movie about the hawk, the tarantula hawk, rather than the <laughs> tarantula. <laughs> but these guys are harmless. So this is species is actually an arboreal tarantula. So they climb in the trees really, really well, which is how she's able to climb my hand. So they're going to live up in the trees of Central America and sometimes South America. That's where they're from. And um, they kind of make a little web hammock and they hang out in their web hammock until something comes by that they want to eat like a bug. And that's when they're going to move very quickly and go after their food and they use their venom, right? So what they're going to do is they're going to um, use their fangs to puncture that bug that they want to eat the venom goes inside the bug and then it turns into a liquid on the inside and a tarantula doesn't have any chewing teeth they just drink their food so it's kind of yeah. like a bug smoothie afterwards yeah so they just suck up and um also um if you've ever been to the amazon you might have heard of this tarantula called the bird eating spider and yeah. um those spiders um like their namesakes, they can eat birds, but normally they don't really eat birds. They um, eat lizards. They eat. Um, they can eat amphibians like frogs, and mm -hmm. they've actually been known to tackle snakes on one hand. So that's pretty cool. Sure. Yeah, they're just a really big spider. So one of those like bird eating tarantulas, whether it be a salmon peak bird eating tarantula or the the what is the other one? Ah, uh, I'm losing my train of thought. But there's another larger uh, bird eating tarantula. Um, that can actually potentially eat like a hummingbird or something like that. But like you said, it doesn't happen that often. But yeah, they can, I mean, any anything that comes around, they're going to try to eat it. Um, it's it's called opportunistic. So whatever opportunity comes by. Uh, tarantulas aren't really that intelligent. Like you said, they don't even have brains. So they're basically just very sensory. So their sense of touch is really sensitive. They have eyes, but they're not very good. They can kind of sense shadows and movement and things. Um, but they're going to, if they're hungry and something comes by, they're going to grab it and some spiders even save it for later right in their webs all right so if you've seen spider-man you know cute mm -hmm. whip, whip, i fight bad guys um you might know that he has a sense called um a spider sense it's basically an a spider six sense so they have little hairs all over their bodies that's also another reason why they're hairy and that's basically how they move around and navigate because like you said they don't really they have poor eyesight so mm -hmm. if one is sleeping and then it falls on your face don't blame don't blame the spider it just has really bad vision also some spiders and also a fish that i've actually saw called the blind cave tetra they actually live in the dark they live in caves so they have no eyes. And even if the tarantula, if it lived in a cave, did have eyes, its whole world would be pitch black. So there's no point in having eyes if you live if you live in the dark. So that's why they also have those hairs on their bodies to help them sense their environment. That's right. So basically they're gonna sense the entire world around them, everything through their sense of touch. So again, the hair is for defense, right? But it's also for sensory, like you said. Do you know one other thing that the spider actually does for defense is gonna be pooping on its enemies. So she actually, she showed that just a second ago. I don't know if you guys caught that, but every once in a while they use the restroom like everybody else, but she did that projectile pooping and she did it right on me, which is part of the job. <laughs> but uh, she wasn't, she wasn't afraid. She just decided to go to the restroom right now. But while you were talking, she did that. So everybody go back and watch the video afterwards. So that was kind of funny. Uh, but yeah, that's something that we can do as well. And this type of spider is very fast. Not every type of tarantula is super fast like this guy or this lady, I should say. Um, she's super fast because they're arboreal. So they run around in the trees and everything else. Most, most tarantulas are pretty slow and they're actually very fragile. All spiders are very fragile animals. They're not very tough. Um, they do have a tough exoskeleton, though, that they have to molt about once a year to grow. Yeah. Actually, I've heard of this animal called the Hercules beetle. 
Oh, it's one of the largest flying insects in the world. They basically have the same range as the pink toe tarantula. They live in South America too. And um, believe it or not, um, all believe it or not, spiders are not bugs. They're called arachnids, and they're more closely related to um, scorpions. And they're also related to other arachnids. Mm -hmm. And um, Spiders, they don't, not like bugs, they, they don't have like six legs. They have, and they actually have eight. Yep. They have eight yeah. legs and two, what we call pedipalps, which are kind of like arms, but they're kind of like mouth parts too. And on a scorpion, their pedipalp arms are actually their claws, but it's actually an extension of their mouth. So they do have these two little things in the front. She's going to climb on me because she likes me. Um, but they're going to uh, have their fangs, of course, and they have um, chelicere, which is where they keep their venom. But right near the chelicere, on either side of their kind of head part, because they have a cephalothorax and abdomen, two body parts, um, right in the front, they have have two little tiny legs but they're not legs they're called pedipalps or arms or mouth parts so that's pretty cool so they have eight legs and two arms i guess <laughs> yeah so most of the time tarantulas don't really spew out a web because you know they're terrestrial so normally they just have to use um their own um fangs they have to use their venom because normally they're just terrestrial or um arboreal or subterrestrial because either they live underground yeah in the ground or in the trees so they don't really need a web like not like the gold golden orb weaver spider that uses its web to catch prey also another fun fact is sometimes you see spiders that have like clear webs that's actually um a kind of trap that lures the hummingbirds or any kind of animal that they eat into that and then they actually don't see it Let's say if you have a bird and it can't see glass, it's basically like that. And then the animal gets stuck in it, and then the spider can just come and eat it and have a delicious feast. So tarantulas mm. don't really spew webs, but they can eventually. Yeah, they can definitely make web, but it's not like you said, like the orb weaver spider, where it's like really pretty or almost like you can't see it. Um, these guys make almost like like Halloween webbing out of their spinnerets. So every um, type of spider that makes webs, not every spider makes webs, like the wolf spider, for example, but almost every other spider makes webs. They have little tiny, tiny, it's hard to see on this species because she's so small, um, but they have <laughs> little finger, finger like projection. There they are. They're like little fingers on the end of her oh. little bottom there. And they are um, on the end of the abdomen and all the way in the back. And those are what make the webs on all spiders. So they're called spinnerets. They're like little spiders that make the web. Yeah, let's see if anybody has any questions about our spider friend. I think some people are saying, hello, look, we're having a friend say hello. Look who it is. Hello. <laughs> hey, hey, Amanda. Good to see you, Jordan. Yeah, thank you for tuning in, Jordan. I know it's pretty early for you. <laughs> let's see. Yeah. Uh, oh, here's a good question. I'm going to go ahead and address this. If I can remember correctly, did you say the male tarantula is bigger than the female? Actually, it's the opposite, Viviana. She's one of our followers. So females are actually bigger than males, and females live a lot longer than males. Did you know that, Moti? I actually did not know. I do know is that some animals, like let's say the praying mantis, the females are bigger than the males, and sometimes in the animal kingdom, there's a thing called cannibalism which means that they eat one of their kind um and b believe it or not sometimes um some spiders do like um a dance to impress the females let's say if it was a bird of paradise it's kind of the same thing and they do a little dance and if the females are impressed um the female won't eat the male but if it fails then the female just munches down the male so um how long can the tarantula, the pink toe tarantula live? That's a great question. So the pink toe tarantula doesn't live as long as other tarantulas, unfortunately, which is my least favorite thing about this species. It's my favorite species of tarantula, but I don't like that they don't live as long. The males only live about three years and the females can live up to 12, maybe a little bit longer than 12. Um, it's a lot longer than the males, but most tarantula females can live a long time into their 20s or even 30s or more. So tarantulas are a very long, livy, long lived arachnid, um, but the males don't. So a, uh, for example, like a, a Arizona blonde tarantula, I have one of those here. The females can live into their thirties and the males only live to be about five or six. So. Mm, 
Well, at least if you want a tarantula or any kind of spider, you should get a female because then it can last 12, maybe a little bit longer, let's say maybe 14, 15 years if you take really good care of it. And mm -hmm. if you just want a spider, get a female tarantula. Win-win. Absolutely. That is what most of us uh, in the zoo world actually seek out when we want to get a arachnid is we're looking for the ladies because, of course, we don't want our, our animals to die too quickly. Um, this is a good question as well. You want to answer this question? All right, I'll answer it. Is the spider venomous? Um, it is, but it's very mild to humans. So if you get bitten, it's just like a bee sting. Um, if you don't have an allergic reaction, it's fine. You can walk it off, go see a doctor. But if you have an allergic reaction to it, that's when things start getting a little troublesome because you will get swollen, yes, and you do have to go to the hospital. But normally... Um, the tarantula venom is only dangerous to insects and the other animals that it eats. But to humans, it's very mild. Absolutely. So this particular type of tarantula is not very venomous at all to anyone except for like crickets. <laughs> um, but uh, some other tarantulas have more toxic venom. It's going to really depend on the species, of course. And it's going to depend on your tolerance. But you definitely won't pass away. You'll be fine. <laughs> uh, if you have a reaction, you want to go see a doctor, like Mochi said. Let's um let's highlight this. I love this comment. Moti rocks. I love his passion for animals. Moti, can you tell me about the first experience you remember having with animals that inspired you to do this? Ooh, that's a really good question. I actually talked about this on Access Hollywood when I was on there. And it basically all started when I was two years old. And um I used I just I was just a normal kid living around um I like toddlers as they do, but then when I saw my first animal documentary called Animal Atlas, it, it changed my life forever. And ever since that moment in time, my mission was to see as many animals as I could before my time was up in this world. So that's why I just really want to see all the animals I have to offer. So that was my mission ever since that time. That's so awesome. I remember watching all kinds of National Geographic uh, programs as well when I was your age and even younger, for sure. Like you said, when you were a little kid. Um, and I remember going to the zoo and learning about all those animals as well in person. And that really inspired me to eventually kind of do what I do now. So that's pretty awesome. That's very important. Mm -hmm. All right. So when did your passion for animals start? Oh, that's a good question. So I remember even as far back as being like, Two or three years old, I was actually in my, my grandmother's backyard and we would find snails and lizards and all kinds of animals. And mm. I remember thinking, oh, those animals are just as important as like an elephant or a tiger or any other animal in a zoo or aquarium that people like usually. So I started developing a passion for like kind of like creepy crawly things like spiders and snakes and animals that are misunderstood because I think they're really important and they're there too. So they must have a, a you know a purpose. And now I know that they do have a purpose. So a lot of um, what we do here at Once in a Wild is also educating people on how to cohabitate with their animals they see in their own backyard. So we started seeing, unfortunately, a lot of people killing snakes and killing spiders and killing all kinds of things that they shouldn't be so we would like to educate everybody so that started you know way long ago when I was super tiny and then I actually um, originally went to school to be a photographer and then I changed my mind once I started working with animals again long story short um, and I started working at SeaWorld and that actually really inspired me too because SeaWorld um, had all this amazing animal training and education and I was so excited to to be there all the time because they have a SeaWorld right here in my hometown so that was really fun all right. So do you have another animal to show us? Indeed, I do. And speaking of snakes, we're actually going to meet a snake next. I hope you guys really enjoyed the tarantula. Please let me know if you have any questions. If I don't get to all of your questions now, don't worry. We'll try to go back and answer your questions the old fashioned way with typing in the answer. <laughs> well, let me see what I have so far. But absolutely, I do have another animal. In fact, I have two more. <laughs> this says, what did you want to be when you grow up? Why don't we answer that? Ooh. I'm not really sure, but I think I'm just going to be a zoologist, um, just like you, Amanda, teaching kids about animals and um, what makes them so special, um, why they've come. And um, yeah, and I also want to travel like I do. I want to travel all around the world and see more unique animals like the axolotl if hopefully they can go extinct. And I also want to try and see some extinct in the wild animals like the Hawaiian crow. Yes.
That sounds great. I'm sure you will figure it all out. We're all trying to figure out life right now. So don't feel bad if you don't know quite yet what you want to do exactly, but you're on a good path. Okay, let me see here. I'm gonna get rid of this comment. So this here is one of my favorite animals. Her name is Harley Quinn. She is, well, you tell me, do you know what species this is? It looks more like a corn snake or more, looks more like milk snake. It is a corn snake. You were right the first time. <laughs> So this is a uh, corn snake and they're found right here in the United States where I live, right? And actually they're found in Florida, Georgia, uh, the eastern part of the United States, kind of southeastern, but also certain surrounding states as well, like Louisiana, etc. And there are many, many of her relatives all over the United States, which are the rat snakes. So this is also known as the red rat snake, but the corn snake is what most people call them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> She looks really cool. Um, actually, I remember once um, on my birthday, I actually had a petting zoo and there was a blue and gold macaw. There were rabbits, um, all kinds of stuff. And I actually got to hold a corn snake just like Harley Quinn. That's really cool. Harley Quinn is a really good animal ambassador and all of our animals are, honestly. Um, we have so many of them that can come to classrooms and things like that and be good representations of their species to give people good um, experiences with animals they might be scared of, just like the tarantula. Um, but Harley Quinn is super docile. People can hold her and touch her. So I'm not surprised that you had an experience with the corn snake that was really positive. These guys are very gentle. Um, they are really good for the environment as well, just like the tarantula and all spiders because they do the same thing. They're going to be a predator in the environment. Um, in fact, all the animals we met so far are actually predators. <laughs> um, this animal is wow. primarily eat all kinds of rodents. So why is it important that we keep rodents under control, like population wise? Because they could probably start coming into your house. Um, you right. probably have to try and get rid of it. I don't know, call pest control if you're in the U.S., but if you're here in Abu Dhabi, all you have to do, either you have two options, let it live and just escort it out, or you got to just kill it. So, That's right. So a lot of people yeah, do that. Yeah, so normally a lot of people I would do um, life. Of, of course, of course, I'm sure you do. <laughs> um, but we need natural predators in the environment to make sure that we don't have too many of any one kind of animal. So rodents, like rats and mice, they have a purpose in nature too, and that's usually to feed other animals. Um, so there's nothing wrong with them, but there is something wrong with having way too many of them. So not only do they overpopulate and come into your house, like you said, they might be a nuisance for uh, all kinds of animals that might eat your food, um, but also they can make us sick too. Ooh, yep. Yep. Yeah. So we don't need any more of that right now. So we definitely need natural predators like snakes, foxes, coyotes. Um, you were talking about the ferrets and things like that. So we need to leave those animals alone to do their job. Um, one really great pest control is not only snakes, but owls. Owls are really good for um, helping with rodent populations. So instead of using like poison against rodents, um, which poison is terrible because it actually goes into the animal that you're poisoning, but also goes into the predator too, once they eat that rat or mouse, right? So um, you're poisoning everybody. <laughs> uh, it's not great. It can actually affect your kids and your pets too. So instead of that, we want to encourage natural predators like snakes and um, owls and things like that to come into your environment, which is pretty neat. <laughs> now, a lot of people do have, um, they have fears about snakes and rightly so. There are some snakes that can be dangerous. Um, I don't recommend picking up any wild animal if you're not an expert. You don't want to go around um, unless you're some kind of zoologist, herpetologist or something like that, picking up snakes if you don't know what you're doing because that can be dangerous for you, right? Um, so there are some snakes that are deadly, but not all snakes are deadly. In fact, no snake wants to harm you. They just want to be left alone to do their job, which is to hunt all kinds of rodents and other animals in the environment and help us out with diseases and parasites that we greatly need right now. We don't need any more diseases going on for sure. Um, but one thing you can do if you do have a problem with any animal whatsoever in your own home or habitat, <laughs> uh, you can call a professional and professional can come humanely uh, remove those animals. Or like you said, uh, like Moti said, you can just let it go. <laughs> So it looks like Moti's having a little bit of an internet issue. Again, sorry guys, technology is not always cooperative and that is okay. We are streaming all the way to across the world in Abu Dhabi. So I'm really not surprised that we're gonna have a couple of little minor things here and there. Uh, I would suggest that you leave and come back again, just like you did before. So I'm gonna remove this for a little bit. 
and I'll have you guys come back in if you're able to. Sometimes this happens, you guys, and thank you for your patience. So if you're just tuning in, my name is Amanda. This is Once in a Wild. We're here with Moti Moles today. We're doing a live stream. It is their first uh, live stream, I believe, on YouTube. If you haven't already subscribed to our YouTube channel, Once in a Wild, I recommend subscribing, of course. You can help us out in that free way. You can like our videos as well. We have many videos to watch on YouTube, including lots of live streams. We do our live streams every Wednesday at uh, 6.30 p.m. Central Time, which is here in the United States and Texas. But we are streaming all the way to Abu Dhabi across the world, which is incredible that we can do that. I think they're coming back in. There we go. All right, there we and go. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> all right. All right, so um, I have a question about Harley Quinn. Is she oh. venomous? No, she is not venomous. Um, so many, many snakes are venomous. I was just talking about that when you left and came back, but that's okay. Um, so I understand that people are a little bit afraid of snakes because some snakes are definitely dangerous. You don't want to go around picking up wild animals in the wild unless you are a expert herpetologist, zoologist, something like that, or you have somebody with you that's an expert, etc. I'm not talking about you guys. I'm talking about the general public. You want to leave animals alone unless there's an emergency, right? Um, but she is non-venomous. She's what we call a colubrid, which is a group of snakes that are non-venomous, not poisonous, none of that. Um, but what's really fun about this animal is she has very bright colors on her top. And also right here, her belly is black and white, which is my favorite thing about a corn snake. Ooh, it looks like, you know, one of those, um, floors in America that are like, um, let's say chess or checkers or something. Yeah, it's, it looks like a chess board. That's right. It does look just like a checkerboard, right? Or a chess board. Now the reason they have that totally different pattern on their belly. So the back looks kind of normal. looks like maybe like the, the dead leaves or something like that. Maybe she could camouflage. She's still bright red. So it might also warn her enemies too. But animals that have bright colors, a lot of times they're trying to warn their enemies saying, hey, I might be dangerous. So they just leave them alone. She's not dangerous except to her food. Um, but by having a color this, and then all of a sudden showing the belly like this, that is going to be very strange. And most animals are going to think twice about eating that animal because it either might be toxic or poisonous, or it might be dangerous. They don't really understand why it changed colors all of a sudden. So that's gonna help her to scare her enemies away and then she can just run away <laughs> while they're thinking yeah. about it. <laughs> all right, cool. so I actually have something really cool about snakes. So um, all snakes actually have um, something called a Jacobson's organ, and it works like a little computer. And that's why they have that forked tongue, just like Komodo dragons and monitor lizards. They actually use their forked tongue to, so basically, sometimes you see Komodo dragons wait, waving their head from side to side, tasting the air. And they basically, let's say, left to right, they smell the air or taste it with their tongue. And whichever side has a stronger smell taste, that's the direction the Komodo dragon goes in. And it's basically the same with snakes. So the Jacobson's organ works like a little computer. It basically tells a snake, there's food there, there's food there, there's danger coming. So that's actually a really cool fact. And if she was a milk snake, and um, there's something in the wild called mimicry. Um, mimicry is basically when one animal fools a predator to look like another. Um, let's go all the way back to Africa. Let's say, um, if you would compare a honey badger to a cheetah cub, then if they were like, um, all curled up into a little ball, then you wouldn't really be able to tell the difference. And also, um, mimicry is used for defense. Um, if she was a milk snake, like I said, she would, she would, uh, mimic the, the actual venomous coral snake. And that would basically deter predators saying, oh, I, this snake is venomous. I probably shouldn't be messing with it. So that's actually a really cool fact. Also, there's, um, animals around the U.S. called king snakes. And if you've ever heard of them, um, the reason why they're called king is because um, they eat other snakes. Like, let's say in the prairies, the prairie king snake would eat the venomous prairie rattlesnake. Yes, they exist. You should go check them out. And um, prairie rattlesnakes, um, they're really, their predators are the prairie king snake. And the king snakes are actually immune to the rattlesnake's venom. Also, it's the same issue with king cobras because they're the they're the longest venomous snakes in the world they can get up to almost 20 feet in length and they're called king as well because they eat other snakes that's why um they're the longest venomous snake in the world 
so amazing. Snakes are actually my favorite animal group. I don't really have a favorite individual animal, but I love snakes the most. Snakes are the, one of the most beautiful, misunderstood animals on the, on the planet. And for some reason, one of the most hated as well. And I guess I understand because again, if we don't learn about animals, right, we're not gonna love them. So if we don't learn which animals are dangerous and which ones are not, we're gonna put them all in the same group and think they're all dangerous and we should just, you know, kill them all. <laughs> and that's not a good way to think. It's kind of like the old way, we're trying to come out with a new way and educate everybody. And even if you see a rattlesnake, you should not kill them. You should leave them alone because they do not want anything to do with you. They're just scared of you. Um, and they're there to do a very, very good service for us and for all of nature, which is eating a lot of rodents. And again, if we have too many rodents, we get sick and we don't want to get any sicker than we already are. <laughs> but very, yeah. very good. All right. So also, um, rattlesnakes, the reason why they're called rattlesnakes is because on their tail, they have a little rattle that goes like, <sighs> oh, also there's an animal called a burrowing owl that mimics the rattlesnake. Mm -hmm. And it basically does something called, <sighs> it, go, it goes a little bit like a rattlesnake to deter predators. And rattlesnakes live in burrows, and so do the burrowing owls. And um, there are also copperheads around, they're around the US, co copperheads, water moccasins, and actually the most venomous snake in the United States is the diamondback rattlesnake. Yeah, there's two subspecies of the diamondback rattlesnake. I don't know if they're actually separate species or subspecies, but the eastern and the western. So here in Texas, we have the western diamondback rattlesnake. And over in Florida, they have the eastern uh, diamondback rattlesnake, one of my favorite species in the entire planet. So beautiful. They are so um, well evolved and like specialized to what they do. Not only do they have that venom, which can, of course, kill their prey very quickly and they can eat their food, no problem. They also have a rattle on the end of their tail, which warns all their enemies and everybody around them. So honestly, they're kind of doing us a favor by warning us. Most animals will tell you hey, leave me alone. I don't want to hurt you today. Go away. <laughs> I'm scared of you. So if we stop to listen and look at animals and learn about that, we can understand that they're not really out to hurt, to hurt us at all. All right. So mm -hmm. um, if you guys have any questions, you should just um, ask them now. Yeah, I'm trying to see if anybody has any new questions that we can talk about here. Mm -hmm -hmm. Oh, here we go. I, are you not scared of holding the snake? I'm not scared because I'm very used to her. And also this snake, of course, is used to me. And this snake has never really been in the wild or anything like that. Um, it would be a very different case if she were a wild snake. But even if she were a wild corn snake from the wild out, for, out in nature that I collected or something like that, which I didn't, um, but she would actually be pretty docile in general, but she might be afraid of me because not used to it. So snakes can learn to be comfortable with humans, just like we can be learn, learn to be comfortable with them is what I'm trying to say. Um, but no, I'm not afraid of her. I've been holding and handling snakes since I was very little. Uh, I've learned about them. I don't recommend grabbing snakes out of your backyard or anything like that. But I've been learning about snakes for my whole life. So I'm very used to them. Uh, the only animal that I'm a little bit afraid of, well, there's two. I wonder if you can guess. Moti, what, what animals do you think I'm scared of? There's two of them. <laughs> Probably, um, let's say if there were alligators or crocs. No, I love those. I love alligators and crocodiles. <laughs> um, I, mean, I also think scorpions. Nope, I love scorpions too. It's something totally different. Well, one of them is a bug and it's a, it's a roach. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of roaches. I do run away from certain kinds. The ones with the wings scare me, but I'm actually a little bit scared of monkeys. Monkeys are a little bit frightening to me. I have worked with them before and it really depends on the monkey and the personality, but a lot of monkeys are really scary to me. <laughs> That's a, that's really weird because I love monkeys. Um, I also love apes like gorillas and orangutans and chimpanzees. Um, but really, the the only animals I'm scared of are bees, wasps, and hornets. When they chase you, they are terrifying because the last thing you want to do is jump in the water because they will wait for you. They are super patient animals, and you also do not want to disturb them because you can take multiple stings. If they were killer bees, um, if you took multiple stings, you would... 
<laughs> yes. Yeah, that is definitely a very valid animal to be afraid of. But monkeys bite too. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, <laughs> Donna says monkeys and roaches. That's okay. Everything else I'm cool with. And honestly, like I respect all animals. And it's okay to be afraid of something if you're unfamiliar with it. But it's not okay to um, stay that way. You don't want to stay afraid of everything um, and hurt them or something like that. You want to educate yourself. So that's what we're here for, right? Yep. That's what monkey balls and once in a while is all about is bringing you guys some knowledge so you don't have to live in fear anymore of the animals. <laughs> yeah. All right. So before we go, um, Amanda, do you have one more animal to show us? I sure do. We've got one more animal. So let me uh, let Harley Quinn go down below and rest. She did a great job as always. She is such a wonderful mm -hmm. animal ambassador. Hmm. What should we meet next? We've met a whole bunch of predators. So I think I'm going to bring out an herbivore next. So we need a little variety out here. Uh, what hmm. Let's see if anybody has any questions really fast. And thank you guys so very much for tuning in to this special time. If you haven't already subscribed to our YouTube channels, please check out Moti Moles and subscribe. And please check out Once in a While to subscribe as well. Let me see here. Hmm. <laughs> yes, Gemstar says, especially the flying roaches. Yeah, they, they're just more startling. I know they're not going to hurt me, but I, I'm startled by them. Okay, yeah. let's see. I mean, I'm not really because I the one rodent I think is really cool is the Madagascar hissing cockroach because um they actually have little holes on their abdomen if you put pressure on them or scare them they actually go and they actually um release all the air out from those little holes so that's pretty cool yeah we actually have um, Madagascar hissing cockroaches right here at once in a while so maybe I'll bring them on the next program that we do together that would be fun um, and they breathe and they breathe and hiss out of holes in their abdomen like you said and those holes are called sphericals which is really fun okay let's meet yeah. our last animal she is really really ready to meet you guys come here come here you can do it yay <laughs> a cocktail <gasps> It's a cockatiel. Her name is Pikachu. I just caught myself a Pokemon. <laughs> and she's so pretty. She is a Lutino, which is a special coloration. Kind of like Ghost, the albino. She's kind of an albino too. She has red eyes and very light you. And she almost looks in the lights. <laughs> she's actually low with orange cheeks, which is why we named her Pikachu. <laughs> the guy. Oh my gosh. So guys, the reason I was so shocked is because I actually had a cockatoo best, uh, a cocktail best friend named Whistle because she would always whistle. And she's just like Pikachu. She was a female. She had little red cheeks. And um, she was my best pal. Um, I would take care of her every single day. I would play with her. Um, and also once I caught a dove in my in my yard in my garden I guess because I have a pretty small yard so we saw a baby dove that was um, injured so I decided to take it in and I put it right next to Whistle's cage and I actually have a picture on that maybe next time I can show you that picture and um, I basically shot Whistle with the little baby dove but unfortunately in the in December of a couple of years ago, she actually ingested poison and she died, unfortunately. I'm so, so sorry to hear that. That's so sad. I'm so sorry to hear that. That's another reason why poison. Um, birds actually are very, very, very sensitive to chemicals and poison and even things in the air. So if you have a pet bird at home, anybody, I know you guys have birds at home, you have to be very careful with sprays and chemicals when you're cleaning and also when you're cooking. That's a really good thing to bring up and I'm glad you said that, even though it was unfortunate. Um, it's something we can we can make sure and tell people because we don't want it to happen to them. Um, so we can talk about that another time as far as pet care if you want, or we can talk about that now. But these guys are in the parrot family, aren't they? Yes, because they're actually more closely related to cockatoos. You know, the really large ones. They can have yellow crests and they're white. Oh, also there's another relative of the cocktail and the cockatoo called the galah. The galah lives in Australia and they you can basically see them flying around fields and eating seeds. So also you've seen a lot of videos of cocktails whistling some tunes like Something like that. And um, the cockatoo and the galah, um, they actually have a little crest that they raise whenever they're like happy or they're threatened. Maybe tweak. 
Okay. Yeah, the crust on top of their head is what makes them in the cockatoo family, like you said. So cockatoos, galahs, cockatiels, all those guys live in Australasia or Austra Australia and surrounding islands, right? They're all from that area of the world, which is pretty cool. Um, cockatiels are the most common type of cockatoo in Australia, as well as being a pet because they're smaller. Um, so it helps that helps, uh, you know, care is easier. Um, but they're super common in Australia. They live in flocks together for safety because they're small, but they're in the parrot family because they have a strong beak. Um, like all parrots, they're just tiny parrots. Um, they have zygodactyl feet, which have two toes in the front and two toes in the back. And they can easily climb with their feet as well as hold um, little pieces of food when they eat it. Like your bird was with the almond on your video, right? Yeah, because basically they use their tongue as a little finger to position the the seed or the almond just, um, to actually swallow it down. And also, um, parrots actually have really, really hard beaks. Let's say if it was a scarlet military or blue and gold macaw going for a Brazil nut, it would literally crack it open with its super rock hard beak. And then it would just position it with its tongue. Fun fact, bird tongues are actually very dry. So mm -hmm. they're not like our tongues, which are wet. Um, theirs are, is actually very dry and they use that. Um, if you've seen some geese photos, then you'll see like um, they have little spikes or teeth as you call mm -hmm. them, on their tongues. And that's also another reason why they use it, to position it, and then they could just loot. And also, by the way, Amanda, does Pikachu do any tricks? So she's not, uh, I mean, she does. She does a couple of different behaviors, as we like to call them. There's a little bit of difference between us um, and like maybe like a circus or something like that, where they would have animals do crazy tricks. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having your dogs or cats or birds do tricks. That's perfectly fine. We try to keep them kind of more natural behaviors, but but you know, you can call them tricks, that's okay. Um, but she she mainly does her behavior of hanging out <laughs> with me and um, flying in on cue. So for the purposes of the video, her flying into the video, that was her main uh, behavior that I was asking for, as well as just hanging out with me because she is flighted and she could fly away. So as long as she's hanging out with me, she's doing what I'm asking. Her friend um, is named Evie. Evie is our male cockatiel. And Evie's a little bit more shy when it comes to doing programs, but Evie actually talks and does does all kinds of fun things. Maybe we'll have a video of Evie or try to have Evie on. I would love to put Evie's talking behaviors on cue um, so that I can show everybody how they talk because it's really neat behavior they mimic. Yeah, because um, parrots um, are actually very smart animals. Um, mm -hmm. They have the ability to mimic humans. They can eat specific kinds of foods. And um, if the, I've actually seen this on a show called Wild Kratts on an episode called Parrot Power, where I actually discovered that some parrots, like the military macaw, they eat um, poisonous um seeds and then they fly to a clay lick and they actually break chunks of clay off with their beak and eat it because the the clay lick and the salt it acts like a sponge absorbing the toxins making them harmless yeah that uh, parrots in the wild have a very very different diet and lifestyle than they do in the care of humans don't they so their diet can be um, a lot of people feed their, their their parrots a lot of seeds and that's okay sometimes but you don't want to feed them too many because they can make them really really fat and they can get really really sick um, and there's a lot of other diet issues that they have um, but in the wild they eat mostly seeds and nuts and then they have to kind of counteract you said if they have something something toxic in their diet a lot of uh, parrots actually do um, go to clay licks and get their their minerals that way and help to absorb the toxins. So it's pretty fascinating. We're always learning something about animals all the time. That's my favorite part about the job, other than working with the animal, um, is we're always learning and, and kind of expanding our minds because we don't know everything about animals. So some of that stuff that you just said about parrots is pretty new to our knowledge. We thought we knew everything about them, but until you study them in the wild, you really don't know and you can't take care of them the best way. Yeah. Um, also, I have a question about once in a wild. What does... Sure. Um, once in a wild make different from other zoos? That's a great question because we are very, very different than most zoos. So we're a mobile zoo. So all of the animals that you've seen today on the program, everybody, as well as, uh, well, we have around 70 animals that can come into programs and do classrooms and uh, all kinds of 
birthday parties and animal therapy and things like that even. Um, all of our animals can travel. So as long as you're around us, which is in the San Antonio area in Texas, um, we can bring the zoo to you in person, but we can also bring the zoo to you in uh, virtual means just like this today. We're, we're streaming all the way to Abu Dhabi, which is pretty awesome. And we can literally share our animals with anybody all over the world through our virtual programs, which is new to us. Um, we're trying our very best, but it's very new since, since COVID happened. We decided to adapt that way. Um, but what makes us different is that we are basically operating um, as a private business. So I have my own animals with me, <laughs> living with us. And uh, we're very new as well, but we, we plan to kind of have some new ideas in the future. But as of now, we, um, we basically have our animals and we can travel with the animals, bring them places. And they are ambassador animals. So they're, uh, it's an outreach program, if you know what that is. So animal outreach is basically showing animals um, either in person or virtually. That way we can teach everybody about the animals kind of in a personal way, as opposed to going to the zoo and seeing all the more kind of dangerous animals and things like that, that you can't like necessarily get into the enclosure with like an elephant or a tiger or something like that. Our animals are a little bit more accessible, so we can bring them you know, to people that want to touch them and hold them and things like that, or just meet them very closely. So it's a little bit different, but we are basically an outreach company or a mobile zoo. But um, I think zoos are wonderful. I think there's there's definitely some amazing zoos that you should visit regardless. I used to work for a few of them, but we are, we're a little bit different in that way. We're just a little bit more hands-on. Yeah. Um, I also kind of do a similar thing. Um, mm -hmm. I actually have been teaching kids about animals, but I don't really use I don't use actual animals. I use little figurines like this giraffe. And I teach them a lot of facts. They're happy with that. And um, Evie is so adorable. Look at those ones. All right. Well, Amanda, thank you so much for having me on Once in a Wild. It's been such an honor getting to see an axolotl, a tarantula, a little cocktail. And hopefully we should do this again in the future. Maybe we can see other unique animals. Absolutely, and uh, my pleasure having you on our show. Thank you for having having me on your show as well. It's been a lot of fun. I uh, hope everybody enjoyed it today. Let me see if anybody has anything to say before we say goodbye. Mm -hmm. And uh, you guys can catch us here on YouTube once a week here at Once in a Wild or every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Central Time if you guys wanna catch us on uh, YouTube and Facebook actually. And uh, make sure to follow all of us, both of us, <laughs> on our YouTube and um, Instagram accounts as well so you can keep up with what we're doing lately because things are a little bit strange right now so we're kind of changing things all the time but don't you worry um let's see if anybody oh it says uh, she's adorable how is evie doing with his training he's doing really well thank you for asking uh, pikachu yes everybody loves pikachu okay very very good well, thank you very, very much. If you guys want any uh, programs for your classrooms, it's back to school right now, right? Are you back in school, Moki? Yeah, I'm now in sixth grade and um, it's back to school now. It's September, everyone's going, going back virtually. Yes, so if you guys are in virtual school, I can literally bring the zoo to you to anyone all over the world, which is really fun. So please let me know if you're interested. My information is down below. Of course, that's a uh, number in the United States, but there's also onceinawild.com. You can request an email back and I can get you some information on how you can get yourself a really cool animal program. They are fully custom. You can pick the time, the duration, and the animals that come into your program. Just like Moti said, we have other animals, so it'd be really fun to have another live stream together. But also if you guys wanna have your own um, virtual program or in-person program if you're in our area you can pick the animals that come into your program too hooray <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right so if you want to follow me um it's at motimal zoo and you should also go check out once in a wild on their instagram page and um i'll see you all very soon yeah all the links are in the description for your convenience let me know if you need anything at all from either one of us and we'll see you guys next time, I suppose. Have a wonderful night, Moti. All right. Have a wonderful day, um, Amanda. And also, thank you so much again. And I'll see you all real soon. All right. Thank bye, you. people. We'll see you all next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs>